So hi everyone. So we'll talk about time varying and streaming data today and uh, let's go on. So let's think about like, you know, typical story like that's sort of a report that's written over time. So let's look at this example here. Wednesday, 28th of April, 99, posted 11.33 p.m. EDT, which is the, you know, Greenwich time. Another robbery occurred in southwestern Ontario today, making this the fourth robbery in the past few months. Delaware Bank in Brentford was robbed by three masked individuals who stole $150,000 in currency, several unknown items from the bank's vault. Bank's robbery occurred at 2.30, lasting all of five minutes and injured, and injured eight people. All injured parties were taken to a local hospital, where one died on arrival. Two people were released and so on and so on. You know, robbery is similar to a crime spree that started on the Chinese New Year, and then a banner bank, and then it's another bank here. You know, and there's a lot of things, Cowder Bank in Brampton, one nearby homeowners mentioning that they do not remember hearing the bank alarm, only dogs barking for a while. This basically a story happens over time at different places, okay? So, The question is like, it's really hard to read and remember what's happening in this story and then, you know, associate different events that happened at different times seem to be connected, but hard to really figure out which item goes with what and then, you know, which one was a different time. This is just a very, very normal, typical thing about time, time varying data or temporal relationships it can be difficult to discern because <clears throat> Temporal ordering can be hard to determine, right? Events may occur in diff spatial disjoint locations. And it's very difficult because you don't know what came before what and what caused the other, you know, because they happened at spatially disjoint locations. You don't know if the cause could have traveled far enough to cause an effect in a different location, right? You, so you don't really know if, if there's a logical ordering to these time events or if they're completely Completely, completely dependent. You know, you don't really know that because time has also something to do with space, not just you know distance and things like this. You know, and so this is really hard to figure out which time shift is acceptable and plausible, which ones is not. So, so to understand temporal relationships, you may have to read this many times and then figure out like what goes together and which there may be the cause and effects over time. You know, so good thing, good way to do this is really to really take this story that is now written in text and sort of make it a visualization, put it all on paper and reason with it. Remember, we talked about this before, you know, take text or take facts on paper and sort of look what they look, look, look like together. So here's like, you know, I'll show you in a second one of those things. But first, let's remember what actually is time, right? You know, what is the good, what's a good formalism that captures time, right? And then time is also very different from other variables. Like you remember, like there's the spatial variables or different non-spatial variables where you can sort of go from X at different locations or you go from one attribute and you go maybe take five more or six more and change your mind again. In time, in the time dimension, you can't really do that, right? It's like basically completely independent quantity, very different from any other variable, because simply because you can't go back in time, right? You did basically once something happened, you can't go back backwards, right? You can only go onwards. In X, in a spatial variable, you can always go left, right, back or front, right? You can always do that, but in time you can't, right? So you will, don't really have an organ, a control what happened once something has happened, you can't make it unhappen. That's why people have a really a different a different sort of connection to time than to any other variable. But time, on the other hand, it's a really good way because you can't go back. It's a good way to order things together, right? You can really <clears throat> go and tie things together along a timeline, right? So a timeline is sort of a good way to sort of bring some order to certain events, even though, you know, you don't know what came first sometimes because, you know, of this time space relationship that I talked about before. But nevertheless, time is sort of a special variable where people that can help bring order 
to certain events. So there could also be a reference frame, right? So there's like these calendars and time, like Gregorian calendar and the Greenwich time and the Eastern Daylight time. So and these are all reference frames. But these are also often used in relative terms, like today, yesterday, fortnight, before Tuesday. For example, yesterday depends on the time zone, right? But yesterday was, you know, what was it today? Or what was yesterday that day, like the 5th of January? Or was it the 4th of January, right? We, 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 you know, it depends where you are right now, right? You have to normalize that into a common framework, like for example, Greenwich time. And sometimes people use things like Chinese New Year, when you have to first understand what actually that means, Chinese New Year, when that is, as opposed to other New Year, which is like, you know, Christian New Year, which is a Western New Year, which is uh, December to January, you know, 31st of January. Chinese New Year changes every year, right? Sometimes February and so on, right? And, <clears throat> and this causes ambiguities because you don't know, right? What New Year was it? If someone doesn't say Chinese New Year, just New Year, then you have no idea. Was it the Chinese one or the, was it a, you know, a different one? You know, that really depends on this. And this, that's caused uncertainties and conflicts. So <clears throat> back to the example from before where you had this newspaper story and you wanted to sort of figure out how certain events relate to one another. So basically you create this sort of timeline chart, right? Where you say on the x-axis you line up time, which is typical. You always use the horizontal axis to line time events. And on the y-axis you take these different locations. And you can also order them, right? By, 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 by distance. So, you know, there's the Legion Bank and the Banner Bank. And you can sort of figure out, you can sort of paint those events that have happened at that particular location, right? So here, you know, robbers come in there, right? And then they open the safe and they, they have no 20 minutes late, they go and leave the bank and then they go to the next bank, right? And you can sort of look at this timeline and sort of map these events on the timeline <coughs> and see if that really could have been the same robbers, right? Or different robbers. So you basically have to know how far Banner Bank is from Carter Bank that they actually could make this transition to the next bank, you know, stuff like this, right? So, so this timeline is sort of a very common way to do this. And lots of people have come up with different ways to sort of show inclusivity and probabilities. And so over time, you know, have come up with different visual languages to, to show timelines. And this is one of them. So oftentimes it's quite questions like when it comes to time, when was something greater or when was something least? Is there a pattern? Are two time series similar? Does a data element exist at time t and where and when? And how long does a data element exist and how often? And how fast are data elements changing? In what order do they appear? And do they exist together? So basically, these kind of questions you can just you can answer just like you know with spatial dimensions. All you have to really do is take your time series and turn them into a vector. Okay, and then you can use clustering. Or you can use mat similarities, right? For pattern, you can use clustering, right? You take these different time series. Maybe you'll you'll take the time series and chop them into subsequences. Then you can start like clustering those subsequences and figure out which which sequence is the same and which sequence is very different. You have to of course figure out which are the time sequence. Like you can say basically like you can subdivide by days or by week or by hour, you know, and just take the, and then basically cluster those, you know, stuff like this. And <clears throat> two data series similar, you can do a similarity metric, take the two time series that you have and then compute like, like a correlation distance or whatever you want and all these other things. So times, basically time data, you can just sort of take them in a vector and sort of compare them in, in this kind of way. Um, but there's also different events that could be discrete or in, in, in interval data, they could be linear or cyclic, right? Cyclic data, we'll talk about cyclic data later. Ordered, they can be ordered, they can be branching. Like for example, there's two things, but there's basically now there's a branch off, like one person does this, another person does this. Or you can see, with, you can see look at the same event, but with multiple perspectives. It can also be a branch in this case, basically you look from from, from one area here and you look from, from the, from the, you know, you look from the top down or, you know, from a different, a different mindset, you know, whatever it is, you basically, you can look at over time at the event with different kind of perspectives. So here's, for example, 
two events that happen over time, you know, and you plot them like in this line chart, you can sort of see NVIDIA stock, which is this, this graphics company, right? This, and then, then here, you know, this is the uh, NASDAQ, NASDAQ uh, timeline. So you can see there's a lot of correlation the way they behave over time. The NASDAQ, the NVIDIA stock here is a little, has a little more variation in it. And the NASDAQ stock here is a little more like averaged, right? Of course, because NASDAQ stock is like the average of many, many different stocks, right? And the NVIDIA stock is just one particular stock. So you expect similar trends, but you said get a little more variability in one particular stock because another stock was maybe a little lower, you know, and then that's sort of typical what you see. So this this is sort of an average behavior which keeps the trend. And the other one is sort of like one particular instant that, that is part of that average. But this, what I'm going to really stress is like, this is sort of the way these time series are usually shown, right? Over time, like as a line chart. Here's a funny one that I found. This is the water consumption in Edmonton, which is in Canada during Olympic gold medal hockey game. And you'll sort of see this 2010. That's when the, that's where Canada won the gold medal in hockey. You can sort of see the water consumption on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. You'll see this is the typical 27th of February is the green one, and 28th February is the, the day when the, the gold medal match was. And you'll see like over time, right, you know, it's like the 13, 1 o'clock p.m. face off, right, and the water consumption very low. In the first period, water consumption went up, then went down again over the game, right, and then there's the third, second period, water percentage, this, the, this, the, the break, again, it was down again, and the fourth, third period, the break, and then Canada wins, right? And nobody, everyone's like here. And then, you know, then between the time, the medal ceremony, also not a lot of water consumption. Because this tells kind of like the story now, right? But what happens during the, in the, in the breaks, right? People all go, you know, they either get water or they go to the bathroom and flush the toilet, right? Stuff like this, you know, that's when they need a lot of water, right? So you can sort of see uh, like in this, with this kind of graph here, time series, you can sort of see a, pic, a, a story being told, right? The story of the people that watching a gold medal game and all of Canada does this, all of Edmonton does this. And you can actually, it's such a interesting behavior that you actually see it in the water consumption, right? So it's basically where time, by, if you take this time series of the water consumption and map a particular event to it, you can tell, start telling a story with this time series, correlating the time Time series of a certain of a certain of a certain property with another with another uh, event in this case the hockey game. That way you can label these extrema a little better, right? So you basically have to sort of associate that <coughs> with some other incidents. Okay, so now there's a few good visualization metaphors for time, and I want to introduce them now. You know the way other than just a line chart. For example, if you have like multiple variables that behave over time, that, sh that change over time, you know, you want to want to see them all together. You need a little more than just a line chart. Okay, so one of them is this what's called theme river, this fairly old technique from 2002. Basically, you associate each variable and the the amplitude it has by a stream. So the way you do this, is you draw a middle a middle line. And you weave, weave these, weave these curves around it, <clears throat> so it looks like sort of. So you can sort of see by the width here that, that that's around, you know, that sort of hangs. It's kind of like hanging in the air, like a sort of, you know, and like, and and, and you can sort of see when the width is broader, there was more happening of this, and the width is slimmer, less is happening, right? So you can sort of. This is about the uh, newspaper themes around the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1960s. <clears throat> you can see that there was like a lot of newspaper going on, newspaper stories going on in March 2061, 1961, right? And then it sort of died down a little bit here before that, and there was another one. And you can also see what people talked about, and you can associate particular time events, Eisenhower breaks relations. Of course, there's a lot of newspaper about this. And then there's the Bay of Peaks, right? If you don't remember that history, you know, I don't remember it, but I read about it. And so this is basically a theme river, which sort of 
you know, you can easily make this. You can use anything, right? To just just use use different. Like if you have multivariate data that vary over time, you can quickly sort of see how they relate to other multivariate data. Right? Actually, theme river is really a special case of what's called stream graph, which I show in this slide. So stream graph is the same idea, okay? Just with a different example now, like the ebb and flow of movies, like basically to see distinguish the, the blockbuster movies from the sort of more sleeper kind of hit movies during Oscar season. So when you look at these, so here this is summer, July, August. That's when sort of the time then the the, the, the blockbusters come. The blockbuster characterized ticket sales characterized basically blockbusters characterized by a very fast increase while everyone the blockbuster movie is released and everyone wants to see it. And then everyone has seen it, it sort of goes down. And then the next blockbuster movie comes, the next one, and the next one. So that's basically sort of blockbuster season, right? So the very short time attention span, but very, very intense. On the other hand, here is sort of like, you know, September, October, November. These are like where these artsy movies come out that get nominated for Oscars. Also here a little bit more, right? You can sort of see these sleeper hits here again, right? Sort of see these sleeper hits that have that, that sort of climb slowly and then they reach a small peak, but last for a long, long time, right? So because everyone sort of finds out about it, it doesn't have this big sort of pizzazz to it, but it's sort of, you know, everyone that they tell each other about it and you go see it, right? And it doesn't play in many theaters either. So you can't sell that many tickets at the particular weekend, right? So this basically nicely shows these different kind of behaviors of different movies, okay? So this is basically called the stream graph. So it's a very nice way to show very diff many different things that happen over time so, and, and relates them. Then another one is stacked area chart, which is essentially like if you look, this is essentially always 100%, okay? You always fill this box. This is the x-axis again, time. And here's the percent. Essentially every slice here is essentially a pie chart, right? So this is what people do around noon. Okay, around noon, not many people work, more people eat. The top thing is eating, right? They have lunch, then they work, some work. You know, they have a household and, 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 you know, TV is not a lot, socializing, some of it, you know. And then as the day moves on, right, people start working again, right? Eating, they don't eat a lot here. And then comes dinner, eat a lot, right? And household. Activities, it's always the same kind of like things. So, you know, die. Everything sort of dies out at the end of the day. Socializing, TV has a lot of width here. This is like sort of prime, t prime time TV around six to eight. You know, and then lots of people, then most people sleep and then sleep and then they wake up again, right? So, so this is a really nice way to sort of show activities. Like when you have a choice between different activities and it adds up to 100%. Right, and it's sort of a nice way to show these sort of, you know, events over time, and and get a little bit of a sense what is the percentage with, as they relate to one another. One example of this is this what's called this name Voyager application. That's pretty old, and basically what this is, it tells you over time which which name was popular. So basically, the width of a stream here is basically how many babies were born of that name. So you can sort of quickly see, well, actually one thing, the observation you make, fewer babies get born, right? So you can sort of see the baby boomers, lots of babies, and now the fewer babies get born. That's like one, you can sort of see this overall, but you can also see different width of stream map go to different babies, the baby names, sorry. So, you know, so here, you know, here you can see there's a lot coarser, right? In the, in the older days, there were only a few names, but now in more recent times, there's actually a lot of names. So these streams actually get much slimmer, but there's more, many more streams. So if you go to this application here, babynamewizard.com, and I click on it now, bring up this web page, you can I make it big. You can start play with this, right? So here's, this is this, 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 uh, you know, this, this baby name thing. So basically you can say, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go and say, um, you know, John, for example, like type in the baby name John. John. Okay, let's see. So John is basically a name that's sort of, 
you know, was, I can't just kill this, but I can't. You know, John was a name that was popular, you know, and now, it, now it's not so popular anymore, right? 2018, not a whole lot of babies get born in name. Mary, let's look at Mary. Feminine name, right? Mary. You know, also same thing, right? Not a lot of Marys are born now, but back in the 1900s, lots of Marys, like Mildred. I don't type it correctly, Mildred, you know. Well, Mildred is sort of a grandma's name, right? You know, like then really, it was very, very, very popular. And then it's sort of, there's no more Mildred. But interesting, another name that is also also grandma name is Sophie. Sophie is actually, was very popular in the grandma time or grand grandma time. And it's becoming popular again, like, you know, 2000. Sophie is like coming back, right? Actually, I have a friend whose name is Sophie, you know, so in that age. So now, now you look at another name, right? For example, Noah, like a very new name, right? Noah is like a very new name. It's a very, very, very common name now. Or I met, I looked it up, what babies are called now, Cairo. It's actually very, is a name that's really popular now, Cairo. I've never, actually I don't really know anybody named Cairo. You know, Nicole, Nico, you know, Nicole, you know. So what's nice about this is, so you can type anything, you know, you can just type any name and see, you know, what, what, you know, what, what, when they were common, okay. You can name, you can, if what's, what, what's very interesting about this is, when you look at these names here, Michael, for example, you know that if you mute, know if you meet someone named Michael, you know you can sort of say, okay, if this person is named Michael, I think probably he was born in 1970 or 1980 or around here, 1950, 1970, because you know that's just probabilistic, right? So you can like you know figure out you know in your relatives or friends you know, or, or, you know, uncles or something. If there is a Michael, you can probably, you know, this probably come, this is probably true, right? You know, so then this sort of, sort of brings me to this slide here. Where you go here, right? So basically here, this is like some, a paper, like a, that some of, uh, you know, that, that I came across like a while ago, where, where they basically want to solve the problem. If someone gives you like a picture of lots of people on it and a list of names. A list of names, okay? Then 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 you wanna but you don't know who who what where you know who who is named who is named how, right? So you only know this person and you have a, you have many names, but you don't know who is Michael, who is Noah, who is Liam, and so on, right? You don't really know that. So, but you would like to figure out who is Michael and who is Noah and who is Mike, Marie and Sophie and so on. So what you can do basically, you can go and and figure out the age of each of these faces, which is possible, right? Nowadays, this, this can actually be, you know, if you have a sufficiently high resolution, you can figure out this guy here is probably like in the 50, 60 or something. This guy here, this is a baby, right? And this sort of older, older guy, right? And this is sort of middle-aged woman. You know, so you can sort of see this, and then you can just go and take the age and go to the names that you've gotten, and then go to back to the name Voyager or something like this. This is really based on the, you know, based on people, you know, declaring the child at the hospital, right? Based on that data, and then you can sort of go in and say, okay, Michael, you know, all the Michaels are around, you know, 60 years or 70 years old, or 50 years old, right? There gotta be one of those 50 year old people, right? Gotta be Michael, right? So that way, basically you can sort of interesting, interesting way how to bring computer vision, age detection and statistical data where you know when the names were most popular, bring them together in a particular application and tag these peoples with the right, with the correct names. If I thought that was an interesting point of research that goes well with the sort of visualization of this the name, baby names. So. Another another thing I want to talk about. We talked about this before, right? That that name that they data often have sort of a timeline. You know, the medical data is really one 
very common sort of name, a very common kind of uh, time varying data because it's natural to human and the, the way they live and the progression of disease and the appearance of symptoms and then how you treat them and how the symptoms sort of you know respond to the treatment, right? And also time signals like ECG. So everything sort of because humans are sort of a time varying phenomenon, right? And so looking at the diseases makes makes a lot of sense. And so one particular example for these kind of time visualizations that get go in the medical field is lifelines and lifelines lifelines too. So this is basically lifelines here, where you can sort of see, you know, the different different diseases that the person may have, this person Linda, you know, and the diseases she had, and then treatments she received, kind of medical, you know, data she she has, you know, she got an EKG here, blood, blood work here, another blood work here, you know, and so on, and then the surgery here, you know, appendicitis, you know, so and on, right? So you can sort of this medical chart over time, and you can also click on certain events and then see the data that may have been here. There's like this ultrasound scan of this baby she had, right? So this is basically a nice timeline visualization that, that sort of tries to call, but you can sort of match events, like you can sort of pneumonia, right? There was the, she got this medication and she got the other, but they got this medication and how long and, and, and how often and maybe how she responded, right? And she has tobacco here and then she, you know, and so on. So basically this is sort of a nice sort of way in which to display time varying data. And then they went on and said, make lifelines too and add a little more information like that where you can sort of see frequency of things better, right? It's by using this sort of, you know, the triangle here. So you can, this is the triangle each time a treatment was done or some data were acquired, you put this triangle. And because of this interesting shape of a triangle, if you space the triangles close, more closely together, they, they, they melt together, right? And they sort of create this very interesting sort of sawtooth shape. So here there's a lot of triangles here, it becomes almost a constant sort of signal. So you know there's a lot of, basically by, by using, looking at this, you quickly sort of see frequent treatments or frequent symptoms, you can see this very quickly, right? It's a very nice way to show the sort of, see those frequency, frequency aspects in this, in this medical or lifelines chart. Another thing I wanted to show you was this, is this uh, way how to deal with multiple levels of detail, you know, that, that is, I thought that was very interesting work by Eichner et al. And, and that was published a while ago, 10 years ago. So basically what they did was they say, okay, this is a timeline, a timeline of blood pressure, right? And this is like, you know, you can see how it, how it really varied, right? Or for a patient, you know, and then, you know, and, and, and you take, take them as different colors. So red means very super high and mean is like sort of a medium and this is low. And, and, you know, you bring this in content and then you start compressing it. You say, okay, well, I don't really have that much room in the in the y-axis, so I'm compressing it. Okay, you can still see the shape of it, but not that much, so much detail. And then I'm going to start compressing in such a way that I only show a little bit, but I'm starting to label the, the interval, right? So this is greater 160, greater 140, and make colors, label them with colors so I can sort of see quickly, like when the low, low and the high, inter, when the low and the high values appear. And then I keep smashing it more until it's just a single line, okay? So now I've compressed it a lot right here. I have this sort of timeline here and I sort of abstracting it until I have a single line. And now we can have like a lot, like I could stack lots of patients with different lines, right, or something like this. But what I like about this, so it sort of really quickly sort of change gradually the level of detail and introduce the new way to show to show the, the, the height, the, 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 the values, right? Similar to semantic zoom, right? So here's like the, the, just a spatial expression with the lines and then I'm starting to show color and here the semantic start, changes a lot, right? And now first here I show actual values and here I show levels, right? Or groups of levels. I think I like, I like this sort of, this is a nice example of sort of multi-scale abstractions. In this case, it's the time varying data. Another, thing to show data in is that when you have cyclic patterns, 
then it's better to, instead of showing the linear layout where you just like line them up over time, but this is the time axis. You can't really see if there's any cyclic pattern here, but if you go and, and map and then line and make a spiral around in a circle, right? And you, f you find just the right period, the right, the right circle, you know, then, then you can actually expose certain cyclic behaviors. For example, here you can see traffic over time. For example, traffic here during the daytime is very high and then at night it's not. And then the next day arrives and it's not, right? The next day arrives, it's not. And you can also see weekends, right? The holidays when there's not so much traffic, right? This is, must be a holiday here, you know, there's not a lot of traffic. And then comes the Monday again, right? Stuff like this, right? Or weekend or whatever it is, right? So you can sort of expose irregularities in the periodic behavior, and you can also expose the periodic behavior itself by mapping it to a spiral. And if you do this, you have to pick the spiral length, the spiral circle the, the right way so you can expose the cyclic behavior, right? If you if you choose the wrong the wrong spiral, right? If you like make it go too fast around or too slow, right? Then, then you're not going to see a lot of periodic behavior. But if you just tune it just right, you can actually expose it, right? So maybe this one time around is 14 hours and not 24, right? This may be too, this is too fast, this is too slow, and then you go, go here, right? So basically, you take a slider and then just start adjusting the, the you know, the, the how many, how, you know, how many samples you fit in one in one in one rotation. Right? That's, that's basically a nice way to sort of show periodic data. But you'll you if you if you don't know what the, the period is, then you'll have to essentially try a few out until you find it. So that's pretty nice, right? Then another another example is this geotime in called Oculus Info Geotime. Actually this is a commercial application. So where you try to where they try to see space and time at the same time. Okay, so yeah, this is X, Y location of a certain, you know, whatever, like maybe someone's path as he traveled or like, it, you know, the propagation of some sort of, you know, disease, who knows what it is, right? So in any event, right, so you can sort of see here, it was here, and then over time it went here. And if the slope is low, then, then, then basically not a lot of time expired to go from one place to the next. So this was a very fast moving event. So maybe this was a plane, right? They took, it didn't take very much time to go from here to here. And then here it started like it's slower because some, they took a, a car and here maybe they took a donkey. It took a long time to go from here to here, right? Because a lot of time expired to bridge across this because the, you know this is a certain height and this is much lower. You can sort of see this and this, you can rotate this around, right? You can look at it from different locations. So this is really nice kind of way to bring time and space into a single picture by using 3D. And this was actually, is actually a product and, and, and they actually, you know, sell this uh, quite frequently. This one actually, this work won best paper award in, in a sequence like maybe 15 years ago. And here's another example of this, right? So it's sort of interesting, entertaining, has a sort of a roller coaster ride look a little bit. There's actually three different things mapped over time. Okay, so this is geo time. And, you know, you need interaction, of course, if you have too long, like just like before, you know, you need interaction. If you have too much, too many variables or too long of a time interval, right? You need, you need to squeeze something to expose something else, okay? So basically just like this overview in detail and, and, and demand and so on, right? So basically this applies also to time series. And I wanna really stress the system here, what's called life rack, which really nicely does this, okay? So let's say you have like one, two, many, many variables and they're all time, time series, okay? And then if you wanna see one variable at greater detail, you can basically pull it apart, you basically take this this vertical length and pull it apart to expose the different, the, the height of the time series. And here less is shown, right? You pull, squeeze them a little bit. You can still see a little bit of the time series, but not as much. And here you don't, you really just see low, high or mid, right? So this basically at this sort of level of abstraction that I showed you before. And you can also extend it in this direction, the X direction. So if you make it wider, you can actually see much more detail on the time series. 
if you make it shorter, you may only see the mix, the maximum minima. Okay, so this is basically the overall idea. And so let me show you a video of this. Operation of system management time series data. The live rack, a visualization system for viewing large quantities of time series data in the domain of system management. 100 devices are represented by rows. This label shows aggregate information about a group, NFS, with four devices. Columns show one or many parameters collected from the devices. This column shows CPU usage. In the current overview, each cell is a small colored block. In these four cells, green means CPU utilization is above 35%. As I make the cells larger, labels for the individual devices become visible. Also, when the cells get big enough, the server is queried for more data, and then the representation changes from blocks to spark lines. Making a cell even bigger results in semantic zooming. Show a more detailed line graph. You can see the current time range by looking at the time boxes, the bottom left and bottom right of the data area. Blue lines show progressive search results. I'm searching on NFS to flag the devices I've already stretched out. Interpreting network environment state. I'm acting in the role of a network administrator interested in looking at CPU utilization of the top few offenders. I begin by sorting the CPU column and then performing a stretch operation on the top few rows to obtain more detailed trend information. The spark lines show trend data for one week. The red squares on each trend line indicate a high water mark. I can see a number of the web devices share the same high water mark in the middle of the week. Load, a measure that accounts for I.O. in addition to CPU usage, was also at a peak for this device during this time, but I noticed this was not the case for Scoop, where load peaked early in the week and CPU later on. I.O. load was also not correlated to CPU usage on Tweak. We can see a steep drop in the number of processes running on Tweak at the exact same time as Manipulator. This drop correlates with a drop in memory usage, which freed up some swap memory as well. When I grow the memory and swap cells for Tweak, I can see that a small, slow increase in memory usage was enough to cause the swap in the first place, and that it seems to run quite near the threshold where swapping begins. This device can definitely benefit from more memory. Manipulator does not share these characteristics. You can see that memory usage built through the week for Manipulator, correlating with the period of heavy CPU utilization and load, that the memory was properly released when load dropped and no swap was used. I expand my time window to six months to see whether some of these trends extend over a longer period of time. Six months is a large query, so it takes a while to get the new data from the server located on the other side of the country, which stores data for dozens of parameters on thousands of devices across several years. Yellow dots show that the new data hasn't arrived yet, but I can still interactively explore on the visualization client in the meantime. Here's an interesting trend. Utilization on Scoop is trending downwards. You can also see that there was a steep drop in memory usage on several devices in August. Network inbound and outbound traffic also seems to be trending downwards. I might want to consider consolidating some of these devices if these trends continue. This data is pretty interesting, so I'll dump a report to show my customer. I preview the data here and then export it to Excel. Incident investigation. Okay, so I'll stop, stop here with this. So, so this basically, I really, really like this system because it really shows you like how you expand in the vertical or in the time dimension. Right, and so expose the detail or minimize it again and obstruct it, right? So it's a really nice system. So it's actually quite old, but still pretty pretty good, I think. So next I wanna talk about streaming data, basically it's time series data that don't have an end, right? That just keep coming. So, you know, so credit card, supermarket, web click streams, social streams, all of the network streams, all of these kind of streams, they keep coming and you really don't know what to do like how to store that continuously, which you cannot, right? There's, there's, there's always an end to the buffer. You have to sort of then give up on some data depending on what, right? So, so basically this is called the one pass constraint where you assume that the data comes in, you can process it only once and then you have to discard it. Okay, so there's no, no way you can archive all of this, right? So now you have to, so, be, so you know, now you have this sort of limited space where you can store this and you got to utilize it in an optimal way, right? So what can you do 
you know, you can, very simple ways, you can just, you know, keep, if your memory is so long, you just keep that much and then throw everything else out and just keep refreshing it, right? And there's more sophisticated schemes. We're gonna talk about this, right? So, so, but first, a few things that, that are also happening with this sort of streaming data. For example, if you try to summarize the data into clusters, you know, these clusters may not be stable, right? They may change over time. But there's something called concept drift, where, where things just, what you, sort of, what is the current understanding of the world may change over time, right? So, may, but, but for, for example, if you take your data and you create clusters to, to explain certain concept of the data, right? But these, the, maybe these concepts change over time. And then, you know, you get something called concept evolution and feature evolution. Okay, so let me give you an example of this concept drift. For example, let's say you take a, a support, like a support vector machine and classify the data in two groups, like the upper part and the lower part, and this is the margin. Okay, this is the bound, the, 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 the plane that distinguishes those two, you know. And, and as time goes on, this piper plane basically moves, right? So basically what, you know, the, the definition of the class of these two classes changes over time. Okay, and then you have to respond to this, right? That's basically, this is what's called concept drift. Like you basically, your definition of thing, of things, of the, of the, of, of these, these, these concepts that you learn changes over time, right? And you have to respond to this, okay? This is like a, an example here with support vector machines, but it happens everywhere, right? Another thing is that new concept may arrive, right? So let's say these are the clusters you found here in form of a three map, right? So this cluster B, A, C, and B. Okay, and then all of a sudden, as time goes on, you know, you may discover there's a certain point right at the at the at this at this corner D where D, A, and C meet, right? And you eventually you find out, wow, you know, over time, actually, I collect a lot more data points there, and actually, a new class is formed. But the decision takes some time to figure this out, right? If there's only one point there, it may just be an outlier that or noise that, that may disappear. But if there's some consistency around, like that, then a class forms and you have to start, you know, keep that class around, you know, and, 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 and manage it, okay? So this is what's called concept evolution, okay? So when you have these sort of time series data, you need to keep some sort of summary of what you've collected so far. And there's different strategies how to maintain that summary. And this summary is oftentimes called synopsis. Okay, it's called a synopsis. An online synopsis that, that you leverage. Okay. There's many different ways to keep a synopsis. Okay. One synopsis is you know you just keep random samples and you just fill keep them in a box and then expire them as as, as you know as time goes on. Or you make a sketch, it's just more a sophisticated summary. Or you can just, or you do, you just do element counting, like a clustering. You just count, you know, you count, you put them in bins and only only say how many of them are in this bin, and then where the bin is located, right? And then you throw away the rest, right? Or 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 some, you know, stuff like this. So this is basically the way this works. Right? Data stream comes in. There's many different variables. Then there's the stream processing engine, and you keep the synopsis, and then in the end you give certain approximate answer of this. Of this of the synopsis, right? Because you you threw away a lot of data, just kept the kept just kept the highlights of it. So one way to do it is this sort of you know sample random sample where you just you know every once in a while you you sample and put it in the box, which is random. Right? This is a very simple way of keeping a synopsis. A more sophisticated one is what's called reservoir sampling, where you try to sort of keep. Basically, reservoir sampling tries to improve upon this random sampling. Random sampling, there's nothing really truly random, right? Oftentimes, you may sample too much in a certain area, not enough in another. So the likelihood of a sample to be appearing is not constant, right? You want to basically, every sample should be, have the same probability to be there, right? Out of N, you want to keep K samples, right? So every sample should have the same probability, otherwise you introduce bias. So reservoir sampling has been proven to help to do this. So the way it works is you, you keep, you basically define a buffer of length K, which is called the reservoir. And the first K samples just keep going into the buffer, okay? And then more samples arrive, right? And then you have to start replacing elements 
from this buffer. And you use this particular kind of way to do this, okay? So you, let's say you'll have, you know, N, let's say you'd like to have a, a, a stream that's N long, okay? Which where M is much, much larger than K. Okay, let's forget, let's not think about it streams, let's just say it's N, okay? So then you basically take, you, you randomize a number, you know, at whatever whatever I you are in right now, right? You're not at the end of yet, but you're sort of in the middle of the stream. And you randomize a number J, and that J basically determines if you if the J is less or equal than K, you're in the buffer. And if J is greater than K, you're not in the buffer. And if you're in the buffer, you'll basically replace the element that was stored there before with the new element. Okay. Then you basically then you reduce. So if, K, if J is greater than K, you don't do anything. If it's less than K, you replace that element J with the new value. And you can actually analyze this. The probability is when you look at this, the likelihood for the ith sample to go into reservoir is K over I, right? K is the length of the reservoir and I is the, the number of samples so far in the stream, okay? So K over I is the probability that the ith sample actually goes in the reservoir is K over I. That it, so it goes smaller and smaller as the stream gets longer and longer. And then the, the probability that the chaith reservoir element is going to be replaced is one over K, because it's equally likely for all of them, right? One over K, K is the length of the buffer, times K times I over I. That's basically, this the likelihood of the of element to be replaced at all. And this is the element, the likelihood of the particular element be replaced, one over I, right? So for the chaith reservoir element to replace is one over I. And you can actually show this, that it's K over N for all the elements in the reservoir. So each element in the reservoir has the same likelihood to be, to be, to be, okay. so K over N is the likelihood. For all elements, you know, be there, right? So basically this, this, this is really nice, right? This really has this constant, constant probability for all the buffer elements, right? So it's, it's very truly, truly random. Okay, and you can show this with induction. It's a pretty good algorithm for when, when things are streaming to make sure you don't overemphasize certain time periods and then underemphasize others. I want to share that here. Then there's window approaches, okay, you know, a sliding window where you only consider the last n elements and you incorporate samples as they arrive and then you expire it. So it's basically this, this kind of thing here, you know, which is like basically just keep the last seven and everything else you don't keep. You know that, but that that's pretty lame kind of algorithm, right? Where you just keep a window, right? So you can do a little better, and I want to tell you something called the class stream clustering, clue stream clustering, that that tries to sort of keep up with the evolving, that tries to keep up with this concept drift, and also tries to keep up with this, you know, with these sort of changing data streams that change over time. Let's assume. You know, it's a clustering argument. So you already try to keep clusters, okay? So you already try to do summarization, right? So you don't kind of keep all the elements around. You just keep like what they are in terms of like a, the frequency they arrive. And, and so you don't have to keep, you just keep a summary like of a synopsis of them, right? So the way it works is basically you have a micro cluster and a macro cluster. So micro clusters are these actual clusters that you form and macro clustering tells you how you summarize the individual clusters if you keep something in it. Okay, so let's assume you're gonna keep K microclusters because you don't, you don't have enough, you don't have only a, a limited number of amount of memory, you keep K microclusters around. And, and when a new data point, data point arrives, you'll either abs you'll absorb it by a microcluster or, or, or you make a new, or you make a new cluster out of it. Okay, so this big decision have to, what you have to make. A data, new data point arrives, either you throw it in one of those microclusters that you have, or you have to make a new cluster if it's not anywhere close to any microcluster. So use the algorithm of this. Okay, so I go over it one by one. So. Um, so first, the data point arrives. You'll figure out the distance of that new data point to all the microcluster centroids. And then you assign the point to the closest cluster and update the statistics in each of the, into that centroid, if in this cluster. So, but if the point doesn't fall within the maximum boundary of any microcluster, 
then you'll have to make a new microcluster. And then this new microcluster, basically, to create it, you have to somehow delete one of those other microclusters because you can only keep K, right? So, you know, so, so this deletion, either you just delete an old microcluster or you merge two of the older clusters, okay? And then this you can decide by what's called the staleness or the timestamp statistics of the different clusters. So if there's a cluster, for example, that, that has not been updated for a long, long time, it's called, that, that cluster is called stale. So you're gonna, you, can, you can remove that cluster or you can merge it together with maybe two stale, maybe two stale clusters that are very close together. You just merge them together in a, in a single stale microcluster. So slowly sort of these sort of stale things, they merge together and then they disappear, right? So as, the new, as new concepts arrive, right? So this is really the way it works, right? So if a new cluster, a new point comes in, either you keep another microcluster fresh again by assigning it, or you make a new microcluster and you start removing the old stuff. First you merge it together and then you remove it, right? So this is basically similar to this pyramid scheme, right? Where you sort of older things get so slowly merged together. They don't, they don't have enough detail anymore and new things they, they had more detail, right? And they, they, they don't get merged as fast. Basically, a really nice way to sort of keep the history for a while. Don't forget it completely, but sort of fade it out over time, right? So it's a very nice algorithm. So this kind of thing, you know, what I just told you about today was, so we talked about, you know, this sort of concept of Streaming data where you try to hang on to the history as much as you can, but slowly expire it. Then we talked about, you know, talked about different ways to sample. Okay, then we talked about the concept of, of, of concept drift, which is a very important one when it comes to streaming data. And then talked about these multi level multi level of detail approaches, right? Which is very interesting. You have a lot of variables and long time spans. You can sort of use interaction to control the level that you want to see at the expense of other levels, okay? So by compressing it. And then geotime, we talked about cyclic, how you deal with how you can expose periods in data. Also very nice, right? Then we talked about these stack area charts, stream graphs, and so on that show you like time evolution over time. When there's not a lot of classes, right? You can show it like this. Uh, it's also very common and then so on, right? So hopefully this helped, this was a good sort of introduction into time varying data and time series. And uh, that concludes this lecture here. Next lecture will be on map.